distinguished thesis. This is an astronomy Galileo Galilei at the University of uh, uh, Padua, where he directs the Complex Multilayer Networks Lab. And uh, he's a leading expert in uh, uh, you know, many different areas of research from system biology, systems medicine, computational epidemiology, and, uh, and uh, his research uh, earned him a long list of prestigious awards, I would say. So, it happens. Congratulations. Uh, he's also the uh, program director of the uh, new Center for Network Medicine in, uh, in Palo. And uh, Maja, thank you so much for being here. Uh, really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. So thank you very much, Davide, for, uh, <clears throat> for the invitation. Actually, this is the first time that uh, I uh, interact with people from the BSC. Uh, but I understood just a couple of minutes ago that the center is new, it's, uh, but it's small. <laughs> so I, I learned these two pieces of information. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming. It's a pleasure also to see that here you have uh, a research line on multilayer networks. We started this uh, more than one decade ago. So I am aging. I recognize this uh, uh, because there are more than 10 years now that I work on this stuff. Uh, I am a physicist by training, uh, but um, I, I love to work uh, in an interdisciplinary uh, environment. So I started to learn the language of biology uh, some years ago. I still have to learn a lot, so please don't uh, don't get mad with me. And uh, uh, the, the talk will be organized in, in two parts, uh, mostly. First part about networks. Uh, so I, I will... Uh, uh, try to make the point for why we need multi-layer networks for modeling biological systems. And I will mention also uh, some topics that can be of interest for people working here for uh, future collaborations. So there are a lot of exciting things that we do with my lab, but also in the community uh, <clears throat> that can be of interest for, um, uh, for collaborating. So I come from Padua. I uh, will be very, very quick on this. Piano Padua is a small city uh, in the northern of uh, Italy, very close to Venice, the usual way to say uh, uh, the existence of Padua. But actually, Padua is uh, much more than being close to Venice because uh, it's uh, uh, the, the location of one of the oldest universities in uh, Europe and in the world, I have to say. We, it was founded uh, more than eight centuries ago. And uh, we had uh, people like Galileo, Copernicus, uh, or Vesalius teaching over there. And uh, I like to stress this point because uh, it's a place, uh, maybe you don't see, I have to do something for, uh, to remove that. Uh, no, because otherwise you cannot see the titles. So let me, let me, no, it's still there. Okay, better, this way you can see the titles. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I like to just to mention this because uh, it's a, a very beautiful environment. They have eight centuries of mindset uh, for both uh, physics and medicine. And it's in this environment that we started this uh, adventure uh, about network medicine. That is a field, that's an emerging field that 10 years, 15 years ago, it started with pioneering works uh, from <clears throat> Laszlo Barapasi, Joseph Loscalzo. These are the intersection of AI, complex systems, uh, complexity science, and system biology, and, and medicine. So what we, we do there, uh, what we are trying to do there, so our main uh, goal is to reconcile the research that we have in silico, in vitro, and uh, in vivo by uh, developing models uh, and algorithms for the analysis of complex data. And uh, uh, we, we are many, uh, we are 63 professors from 27 research labs, both dry and, uh, and wet. And we are a part also of this uh, excellence research network uh, that is Net Network Medicine Alliance. We are literally uh, at the beginning of our journey. So if you want to collaborate with visitings uh, uh, or uh, any other type of collaboration, please get in touch with me. Uh, we have money for this. Not a lot, but we have money for this. We are still uh, uh, growing. And then we are also looking for partners for doing this. Because we are um, very recently signed with uh, uh, a research center, a private research center in, uh, in Italy and with the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna. So uh, we are open for more structured collaborations. So today, what I want to, uh, to do, since the, I, I understood that uh, the, the, the audience is uh, heterogeneous and interdisciplinary, 
is to try to understand uh, why we need networks uh, to analyze uh, data coming from biology, but also what is the right way to do that. Because uh, a lot of times, uh, networks uh, are used like uh, a black box, uh, just for algorithms, like if it was the NF algorithm. And this is not the case because it can lead to very poor, uh, poor results. And then I want to put this uh, into the context uh, uh, of predictive models uh, and uh, to answer just at the end of the, uh, of the talk, the question, are data enough? If we want to do by to do applications for biology and overall for for medicine, so let's see if I will convince you about the answer. So usually, traditionally, the human body has been seen as a collection of components. Uh, these components uh, can be of different type, but at the very beginning, we have different systems, and we all agree that all of these systems interacted and interdependent with each other. You cannot switch off one of these systems and pretend to. To, to, to be alive. Then uh, for each of these system, you have a, a hierarchical organization. I told you I am a physicist, so <clears throat> bear with me. Uh, we see this in a hierarchical uh, way. Uh, you have your organs, uh, then the organs are organized into tissues, the tissues into uh, cells, uh, and so on, until you reach at the very end of the, uh, at the smallest scale, uh, the level of atoms and, and molecules. This is interesting because uh, this way of attacking any problem in science uh, led to what is called the reductionist approach. Uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, you see an organism like if it was a mechanical clock, and then you say, well, uh, I have a problem. I can use this. I, I, I have a problem in one piece of my, uh, of, of my clock, then it's broken. I go there and I fix it. This makes perfectly sense. Actually, it's a way of thinking that is not wrong, it led to a lot of uh, successful results in, in medicine uh, for what they call the Mendelian uh, disorders. So we had an explosion of these of these approaches relating one gene or the mutation in one gene into uh, to one to one disease. And then, of course, once you have this uh, linear mapping one to one, you can say then I can develop a drug for fixing for fixing the specific thing. And then. Uh, the, the let's say I, I iterate again uh, this way of uh, of thinking. Well, the point uh, is that while it works uh, pretty well for uh, diseases that are Mendelian, this way of attacking uh, uh, problems does not work uh, when you have a complex disease, because this is many diseases are actually complex, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, linear one to one mapping uh, doesn't work um, any anymore. Why? Because some diseases like schizophrenia or the Alzheimer's disease, I see, I, I, I know that there are experts here, so I will not go into, into details. You know more than me about this. Uh, they, they depend on the combined actions of, uh, uh, of genes. So it's, uh, it's uh, impossible to, to, to use the same reductionist approach as before. Why? Because uh, these um, <clears throat> proteins, for instance, uh, they are part of different contexts. Uh, they can be part of canonical pathways. They can be part of, uh, uh, they can be linked uh, or having relationship due to co-expression. And then what you have here essentially is a, a, a network, an intricate web of interactions and relationships that make very difficult to attack just one gene and pretend that your intervention will lead to a specific deterministic outcome. It does not happen in reality. Uh, well, it happens for a few cases. And uh, th the reason is that there are multiple layers of organization in a biological system. So you cannot just do that. And these layers uh, are interdependent like our systems uh, in the human body. And what you do, what you do at one level uh, actually influences what it can happen in other levels. And uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's not only a matter of, uh, of levels, uh, it's the combined uh, action of uh, genes and proteins that have a direct, a direct influence on the disease, like here, but also indirect influence, like uh, uh, multiple steps from the disease. But it's even worse than that, because then you have your drugs for your uh, targets, as usual, but then you have also that uh, some of these uh, proteins are uh, related uh, to another disease. And then you see the diseases are somehow connected by some intricate uh, connectivity over here due to, uh, to intermediate path, um, targets. And in fact, what they do uh, is that they build networks. And uh, actually, more almost 20 years ago, I have to say, there was this first uh, attempt to say that diseases 
have to be understood or at least analyzed, investigated as part of a network themselves. And you have this network of disease-disease interactions where they share, for instance, a genetic, uh, a genetic origin. I will tell more about this because uh, I have an application uh, with multi-layer uh, networks. I, I am learning uh, uh, that you uh, uh, also are working on this, thanks to, to, to David. So it's a perfect choice. I didn't know this in advance, but uh, the timely, timely choice. So, uh, networks uh, are usually used uh, as uh, descriptive models. Uh, why descriptive? Well, you, you have your data, then you uh, use the, um, the standard uh, uh, thing that you can extract information from, from a network in terms of connectivity, how the, your units tend to form uh, triads, uh, how they tend to build uh, clusters, uh, how they communicate through, uh, through paths, uh, and so on. So uh, in terms of descriptive models, they do a great job, but they can also be used as predictive models, uh, actually. If you start to encode your biology into formulas, uh, into equations, uh, what you can do is to associate uh, to your nodes some kind of a state, and then you can uh, uh, in encode, you can model self-interactions, uh, and you can encode here the network effects where you have two bad interactions, for instance, mediated by this uh, uh, object that is the agency matrix and the coupling strength for the network effects. And then you can have noise, you can have higher order. You can do a lot of things when you go to, to modeling. Why this is important? Because with this, you can enter into the, the realm of predictive analytics instead of uh, just a descriptive. And uh, on this uh, <clears throat> later, I, I will tell more. Then we have different perspectives when we analyze networks. Uh, the first perspective is a purely topological, where uh, you, you see here, you have highlighted uh, a, a cluster. It's uh, due to, uh, to the fact that we, according to some prescription that we have, you know, the density of links or whatever you like, uh, we can say that there is a cluster over there, or we can make a partition of our system into clusters. But there is also a functional perspective where you go beyond purely structural information. You are adding some dynamics. You see again, for instance, some biological information. And then the same net, these are the same network as this one, but you can have uh, that the, your clusters uh, can change. It can change a lot according to the dynamics. This is uh, literally one of the latest developments in, in network science. And uh, it's interesting, but I will very scratch the surface here, because uh, you can extract a specific type of information from here, from both the topology or what we call network-driven processes. Uh, you can extract a distance or the notion of distance. And uh, from here, you can embed your network into some latent space where you have your geometric manifold. And here you can do a lot of things. There are several works about this. Again, it's just to mention if you have more questions so we can talk later or no, no problems. But the point, what, what is the, the, the idea? The idea is that even a, a network structure, if you change the dynamics, you can change the way nodes are associated to each other. This is very important because it relates to the function. And uh, we devise methods to investigate the function. Uh, this is, for instance, the case of a random walk, so an old paper of mine. Uh, where uh, we use diffusion uh, to introduce this concept of uh, of distance uh, and diffusion. This is the, the equivalent of a diffusion eigenmaps. So it's a very old uh, uh, work in, in in machine learning. But from here we can learn a lot of things, and uh, you can extend this to multi layers. You can extend this even beyond diffusion. We did the same of this work in this other work here that is going to appear in PNAS now in the next couple of weeks, where we do this for general nonlinear dynamics. So it's a powerful way of thinking about networks that will give you also a multi-scale perspective because now the dynamics has time scales and you can use the time scale to investigate different uh, scales with your, uh, in your network. So uh, the fundamental assumption of uh, network science uh, is that links encode some type of information. We all agree about, uh, about this. Uh, the point is that in biology, most of the time, you don't measure the link directly. So in physics or in a physical network, if I, I, I can measure the existence of a road you know, between two, two areas or a, a pipeline between two reservoirs, et cetera. In biology, it's difficult to measure directly the existence of one link. Okay, what we do is to infer the existence of a link most of the time. So we work with correlation networks, with similarity networks and stuff like that. Why this is important? 
Because uh, while uh, we have, uh, you know, most of the time, we um, have a, a network that is not observed, we do a lot of measurements uh, from, for instance, here, we can try to measure directly the links, but then we have noisy measurements. We can measure indirectly the links, for instance, from the dynamics, from observation of some temporal variation of uh, physical observables, et cetera, et cetera. Then what we do after here is to try to reconstruct our network. But this is not the same uh, as that you have here. And uh, here, it, well, we have a lot of uh, issues. And uh, uh, one thing that I really don't like, uh, it's modularity. I don't know how many of you know mo what modularity is. Okay, not a lot of people. Uh, so I will not explain what modularity is. So I will not bias the rest of the room. Uh, but imagine that there is this measure. It's a measure that is widely used. It's a way to find clusters uh, into, into a network, okay? By the user and modularity is a, a kind of objective function, okay? You, you just to know this. What is the point? That in the way it's defined, uh, you can calculate modularity even from a random network and uh, your random network will give you non-random structures. You will see non-random clusters in your random network. And then you don't want this to happen because if you do this for a random network that is synthetic, where you have put the random stuff, you know in advance the answer. But if you apply this to data, then you can find spurious clusters. And then on, on the top of those clusters, you build a lot of narrative because you try to understand the biology, et cetera, et cetera. The point is in this example, what we did, uh, was to have a random network where we put just uh, six nodes connected in a, in a click. And if you do the standard modularity maximization, you get this, uh, that is a mess. It's, uh, it's not representative of reality. Well, this is the reality. And then you say, okay, well, it's magic. No, we are using a grounded approach that is based on a generative model. Okay, so what I, I am advocating here is just uh, to avoid using uh, uh, things in network science uh, uh, blindly, but to use them uh, by understanding what they do in practice. Okay, so uh, using uh, generative models uh, to attack a, a problem usually is a very good way to, to do science because uh, most of the time you find the results that are uh, aligned with, uh, with, with the reality. Then there are other cases. So in the previous case, the nodes and the links were really there. In other cases, you don't know what are the links. You reconstruct the links, how you observe something, and then from something, you build your correlation, similarity, causality measures. And then here it starts the mess because uh, you have to do something. I mean, you want to build your network. So the only thing that you can do is to either threshold your network. So you say, I will keep only the most significant correlation, fine nothing wrong with that. Then I will binarize because in this way I can do my network analysis, you, I, you arrive here. Or you can do another in another way. You build your causal, your similarity network. You use the coefficient that you find as weights in your network and you go here. What is the problem with this? Well, it's a big problem because network science was not designed to work with correlation. So network, the basic assumption of network science is that links exist and they encode something, okay, a relationship an interaction. If you apply blindly network methods on correlation networks, what you will find probably is a spurious results. Okay, so modularity is not wrong, but I mean incomplete by design. And now I see a lot of papers, especially from the biological field, where they apply the modularity on the top of correlation networks. So I cannot trust any of those results, okay, because it's really complicated to understand what they are finding. So what you have to do is, again, it's a good inference. And a way to, go, to do good inference is to reconstruct, for instance, an ensemble, a probabilistic network model uh, that is uh, compatible with the observed correlation. Okay, so this is, again, inferential method uh, that makes sense because it will avoid the pitfalls of the, of the previous approach. But now, of course, you have to sacrifice something because you are working with uncertain links. And what you are sacrificing here is uh, the certainty of, uh, of, the, of the link and the possibility to measure everything with only one number. So do you know what is the degree of a node? The degree of the node is the simplest thing that you can uh, calculate for, for a node in a network, is the number of connections, okay? As, as simple as this. In a real network, in a physical network, the degree is one number. In a correlation network, it cannot be one number, it must be a distribution. 
because uh, you cannot uh, assess with certainty that uh, your your node will have three, two, four, five links. So this is a, a better way. I'm not saying this is the best way, but it's a better way than for dealing with this type of uh, of uh, information. We have written a, a perspective piece with Iago Peixot and Leto Peel very recently. I invite you to read this paper. It's uh, been published on Nature Communication in 2022, where you will find plenty of these uh, cases uh, and these uh, these examples. So now I have to to move uh, to move on. So now let's go to the second part of the talk. So uh, because uh, empirical networks uh, do not exist uh, as singletons, uh, they exist as part of something else. And this is the real needing for multi-layer networks. So I, I love the, the, the work uh, by Francois Jacob. He got the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 74. And he was saying uh, that uh, what biology study in practice is a system of systems. He was telling this in the 70s. Okay, but actually, more um, uh, the multi-layer network uh, let's say, um, field uh, was born uh, about ten years ago. Uh, the, the pioneering paper about this was published in 2010 by the group of uh, Mason Porter, uh, Peter Mucha, and others, where they attacked the problem with uh, a strong mathematical uh, uh, flavor uh, for the first time. And uh, why it's uh, really important for biology? Well. Uh, this is, uh, uh, let's say, a uh, schematic illustration that, that shows uh, the, multi the multiple scales that are involved for, uh, in, in, in the study of, uh, of biology. You start from the lowest level where you have the genome, and then you increase uh, your spatial scale uh, step, uh, step, step by step. Well, you have the, the level of proteins. Uh, proteins uh, interact together to form biomodules and pathways. There you have the level of cell-to-cell uh, -cell interactions and so on until you reach the level of a full organism and then organisms interact with each other to make an ecological system or a social, uh, or a social system at the level of a population. Why this is nice? Because if you have a perturbation at one level, this perturbation has the potential to propagate across all the other levels. And so uh, you need a mathematical framework to deal with this type of things in such a way that uh, uh, you don't have to, uh, to, to invent uh, uh, weird, uh, weird things to, to, to analyze this type of systems. So the idea is to move uh, from, uh, <clears throat> once now we, we have the data, to move from uh, this uh, approach where essentially you, uh, so, okay, you, you, you have uh, just uh, genetic information and in, in the best that you could do was to link a genome with, uh, with some phenotype to this framework where instead you have the coexistence of uh, multiple units. They can be uh, proteins, genes, uh, transcription factors, and, and so on in different contexts. Okay, and this is important because they, they are organized in different contexts, and also the context they interact with each other in, a, in, 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 in some way. So what we tried to do in physics uh, one decade ago was to try to understand how you can describe complex systems that are uh, um, <clears throat> represented in this, in this way. There are a lot of applications. I don't want to convince you that this makes sense because you have a research line on this, so you already believe on it. Uh, but uh, just to, to mention something that is interesting, uh, here you have, uh, uh, for the E. coli, you have a metabolic layer connected through the interface of proteins to a gene regulatory network. And uh, here the authors have studied the robustness of this coupled system with respect to perturbation. And they have identified, for example, which layer is less robust than the other to external perturbation. This can be used to gain a novel insights about the biology of the E. coli. Instead, in another, in another work that is more recent, I did with my lab, uh, the, the blue lines that you see over there uh, make the, are the interactome, the human interactome. There are also the human proteins over there. And all the other bubbles that you see there are the, um, the proteins that are targeted by viruses, okay? By all the viruses that we got that about 90 viruses. And you can see this as an interdependent system. So the human interactome that is attacked by the other viruses, and you have a network of networks because the virus have their own um, interactome. Okay, so the question is, how can you model in a mathematical way all of this uh, complexity? Well, the idea was to uh associate to each context a color and now we call it an a, a layer 
And then uh, in these layers, you define uh, nodes. These nodes can exist in multiple layers or exist only in one layer, for instance. Then just for a matter of terminology, I call a state node a node that exists only one layer and a physical node, the collection of all the state nodes corresponding to the same, to the same node. In this way, um, so we, we fix just the, the terminology. Then we have uh, uh, connections that are within each layer separately, and we call it intralayer edges, and connections that are across the layers, and we call interlayer edges. So this is just to fix the terminology. Why this is interesting? And this is also very general, because the way nodes are interconnected between one layer and another can themselves be uh, represented in terms of networks. So now here in this uh, representation here, each uh, node uh, is a layer. And then you can connect the layer in different ways, okay? So you are not forced to connect things uh, in a vertical way like I did in this picture. You can do a lot. So this is a very flexible uh, uh, framework. And in fact, you can build networks of networks in this way. And then we have to uh, make the mathematical case to represent all of this complexity. In terms of data, you can have uh, information only about uh, the connectivity within each layer. Then we call it the edge-colored uh, multigraphs. So you you uh, don't have interlayer links, or you can have interlayer links, but they are uh, they they make complicated patterns. So the multiplex is the one that you shown before, but they can be interdependent networks. The interdependent network is like the example that I uh, told you before. The human interactum and the viruses. Uh, uh, around they are interdependent because the, the nodes are not the same in each layer okay they are different another example to understand interdependent networks is to assume the uh, i don't know the the power grid the, where you, the nodes are uh, power stations uh, and uh, a telecommunication network where, where you have the nodes are servers uh, and, and computers they are interdependent but the, they are misaligned okay they don't, they don't have the homogeneous set of nodes you can call them node color if you if you want uh, uh, as uh, uh, they do in other fields. Well, what is the trick? I promise uh, no, not a lot of math. The trick is to, uh, um, to see a network uh, as a tensor. Uh, here, you can associate to each node the canonical uh, vector from uh, the, the canonical basis. So then you see a matrix as a linear combination of Kronecker products of the canonical basis. And uh, we just, uh, we are physicists, so apologies. Uh, uh, we, we don't like uh, the, the, the previous, uh, this, this, this notation. We, we like a lot to work with the covariant uh, notation for, uh, you know, this is make us more smarter. Uh, Einstein was using that notation. And, uh, uh, but the idea is exactly the same. So if you, if you, go, if you get uh, this one, uh, this is exactly the same written in just another way. What is the, the, the idea? That you associate a vector to a node and you can see a matrix, the agency matrix, uh, as a collection, a linear combination of uh, uh, Kronecker products of nodes. In this way, the network becomes uh, a tensor. Uh, this is interesting because uh, you can expand this idea to the level of network of networks. Now you have, uh, you see, you have a matrix, a rank two tensor for each network, each layer here in this, uh, in this system, but you have the same well, other matrices, other rank two tensors, also for the interconnectivity between any pair of layers. And then you can see this collection of matrices uh, across layers and within layers in such a way that you do exactly the same trick as before. So you can build an object that is a linear combination of uh, the, the, the canonical basis, but the basis now must be in another space because now we have more elements here. And we need uh, at least four indices to indicate this object. Why four indices without uh, becoming technical? Because if you want to say which node in which layer is connected to any other node in any other layer, you need four numbers. Okay, so you can think in terms of coordinates if you want. Then this is why you need four, four indices. And uh, well, but working with tensors, uh, especially the higher order tensor is complicated, uh, at least for some of the problems that we, we face in network science, like uh, even calculating the centrality of, uh, of nodes, uh, you use uh, you know, eigenvector centralities, all of this stuff. So you want to find a way to deal with tensors without becoming crazy. 
And the idea was uh, in this uh, in this work from uh, mathemati applied mathematicians. So it's a very old work. It's not uh, related to multilayer. It's, it works in general for tensors. You have your uh, here the, the matrix at t three times three. You just uh, change the dimension of your object, uh, preserving the information. This is called the flattening or matricization. Okay, nothing more than that. We can do this with our multilayer object. It's a tensor, so I cannot draw it. Uh, in four dimension, but uh, you can plot uh, your uh, layers on the diagonal blocks of this super matrix. We call it the supra agency matrix. And the off diagonal blocks will indicate the connections from across the layers. Okay, so as simple as that, then you have again this object. You have to take care to be to be careful with uh, with the indices, but the idea is as simple as as uh, as that. And uh, so what is the take home uh, message uh, about the usage of multilayer networks? Because again, once you start uh, with a new thing, it happened to me when 10 years ago, you start to see everything around you in terms of multilayer networks. Uh, it, it, it's, it's normal. I mean, uh, at some point you, you even become obsessed to find multilayer networks everywhere. Uh, I, I had even a lecture in a summer school, so multi-layer networks are everywhere. Well, actually, this is uh, not necessarily the case. It's the case uh, where you have, uh, you, here you have a trade-off between uh, the importance of the links of the connections uh, within each layer and across the layers. Okay, so there are situations where uh, uh, if the, cap the layers are poorly coupled, so weakly coupled, they don't interfere with each other. If they don't interfere with each other, you don't need to use a, tensors, uh, rank four tensors to analyze your system. Uh, most likely you can analyze your, uh, your system, your layers separately, and you will get good results. Otherwise, uh, if uh, you have a strong coupling, so th th there is a, um, a, an important uh, effect uh, um, from one layer to another, just because they are coupled in some way, then you have the emergence of multi-layer effects. I recommend this very beautiful paper appeared uh, uh, in 2013, where they analyze under which situation in synthetic data uh, you have this emergence. And it, it's very interesting. It's a, it's a kind of a toy model, but it perfectly make the, make the case to understand when you have this uh, strong coupling and, and the multilayer uh, becomes emerge, emerge from, from, the, from the data. Then, just to bring some examples, uh, again, I will not go into it, but we are working now with tensors, and uh, uh, you can uh, rewrite uh, uh, the vast majority of network science uh, to work uh, with network uh, with network not uh, with a tensor notation. So, uh, just for instance, uh, here, this is the typical eigenvector centrality. Okay, that or here you have the, the page rank. What are the, the eigenvalue problems? You have your matrix. You calculate the leading eigenvalue and the leading the leading eigenvector, and that's it's the vector of centralities for your uh, for your nodes. You can use uh, this notation to port uh, this problem into the multilayer realm and get exactly the same definition. But now, what is the issue? Is that you don't have your unit, your basic unit is no more the node, the physical node, but is the state node or what is called the node layer. Okay, so you get the centrality at the level of a single node in each single layer. And this is the, 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 the big difference. This is also a big advantage in some cases, okay, because you can, uh, uh, you can calculate the centrality of a node in its context while accounting for the influence of all the other contexts. And this is the big, uh, the big, uh, the big deal. Why? I try to convince you in, uh, in 10 seconds. This is the, ten, the tensorial eigenvalue problem, let's say the counterpart, and uh, you aggregate after you do this calculation. Okay, so to have the centrality for each node, independently of the layer, you aggregate after you use the tensor, the multilayer tensor. Why? Because if you don't do that and you aggregate before the calculation, what you get, what you do is, is this operation. This operation is equivalent to aggregate, to calculate an aggregate network before and then calculating eigenvalues and eigenvectors. You know better than me that if you, that uh, the eigenvalues of the sum of two matrices is not equal to the sum of the eigenvalues, as simple as that, okay, without going into the details. Then you can show this mathematically and uh, that you show that uh, uh, if you aggregate before, you will always get different results from what you should get from the multilayer where you are accounting correctly for the existence of different contexts. 
And the last thing before moving to the applications uh, is uh, just to mention that, uh, again, related to what I was saying before, you start to see multi-layer networks everywhere, but uh, you also have to put, to ask a question, the, the, the question, is the multi-layer the best way to analyze uh, this system? There is now a practical way to answer this, uh, this question, and is to compare the, 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 the information content that you have in different layers. So when I say information, I mean it's measured in bits, okay? It's use a, a concept from, from information theory. And then what you want to understand is if uh, the information content that you have uh, uh, before uh, the aggregation is compat compatible or better or, 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 or not than uh, uh, what you have uh, after you aggregate everything to a single, to a single network. There are ways to do that. I have no time to do it, but if you are uh, curious, uh, ask, ask a question or we discuss later. Then you can do this at the level both of the structure and the function. With the structure, you use only the topological information, then you have uh, the structural reduction, or you can use the dynamics for doing this reduction and you have uh, your functional uh, your functional reducibility. Very recently, we have extended this way of thinking even to answer a very big question now it's a, for the for the hype that is a, uh, in network science about uh, higher order networks. I don't know if you ever listened to it, hypergraphs, simplicial complexes, but uh, in the community, in the network science community now, every conference is only, mostly about uh, hypergraphs. And the question is the same. Now people uh, see hypergraph, uh, hypergraphs everywhere, even when uh, probably there are no hypergraphs uh, there in, in the data. So the question is, okay, when I have to use uh, the framework of hypergraphs to analyze my data. And the idea is exactly the same, where instead of layers, we have the orders of the uh, of your of your model. And there are literally hundreds of applications, some applications. Uh, so I, I, I just mentioned here some of the ones that I, I, I like I like the most. Some of them come from even I, I see people people uh, uh, people here I I, I discover we, we we try to met with uh, and I for a while uh, mm -hmm. and we by chance met here and uh, <clears throat> these works uh, are, are are relevant because uh, they introduce uh, novel ways uh, to rank or prioritize uh, nodes uh, in biological systems uh, for specific applications, uh, understand better lethality or which targets uh, um, to attack first and, and so on, or to understand the mesoscale organization of a multi-scale, of a multi-layer network. So I'm sorry, I cannot go into those details. I will discuss about two uh, of, our, of our works uh, coming from the lab. The first is this multiplex model representation of disease-disease uh, interactions. I was mentioning before uh, that you have these uh, links between uh, uh, genes and, and diseases in Mendelian disorders, but also for complex disorders. So let's, uh, without going into much detail, uh, we used the uh, OMIM data for gene-disease interactions and the human phenotype ontology for uh, symptoms, uh, disease interactions. Then we have uh, filtered the link at this information and filtered it through the disease ontology to build uh, a, a, a network uh, with uh, nearly 800 diseases. I will give you the more detail in a, in, a, in a second. So what, what we have here is uh, connections, information about uh, inter relationship between genes, uh, same symptoms uh, and diseases. What we did, uh, so here you have the, the, the diseases in the middle, and here you have the symptoms uh, and, uh, and the genes. Uh, you have bipartite networks. Actually, this is a kind of tripartite network, okay? What you can do is to say, to see these as two bipartite networks and say, I will project my bipartite networks on the dimension of diseases, okay? This is what, what we did. So in a symptom disease uh, network, uh, you project on the top of the disease. So the two diseases will have a link if they share a symptom. The same for the genetic part. Two diseases will share will have a link if they share at least one gene. Okay, and so on. In this way, you can build a layer that comes from the phenotype and a layer that comes from the genotype. And then you can ask, okay, can I study uh, how these diseases uh, cluster together? So you can do this uh, community detection on the top of this uh, of this uh, of this system to discover if there are uh, relationships that maybe are not uh, in the literature. Okay, we did it, and uh, with the Sharma Lab, 
in Harvard. And uh, what is the idea? Very quick on this, because this is again another method. I want to stress more the, the, the result. The idea here is that you have your multi-layer. You want to understand what is a community in a multi-layer. Well, uh, you, 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 it's related to group to grouping uh, nodes uh, together, but these nodes can be across layers. Uh, so the interpretation of being in the same group uh, is in fact uh, that you are finding kind of overlapping communities, okay? But th this is a very natural interpretation for this type of problems. And then if you don't have, uh, for instance, uh, interlinks, uh, you can perform some multi-resolution analysis, uh, but this is not uh, our case. And which method to use? Well, there are many. Again, uh, I opt always for grounded methods where you have something that you can measure like number of bits and you can use some grounded uh, uh, principle like the minimum description length principle uh, to guide your uh, your analysis. We did this uh, with uh, this method that is called the InfoMap. And essentially what it tries to do is to find regularities in the data and uh, by means of a compression algorithm, let's say, and, and it uh, will give you as a partition uh, the, the one that will uh, make the minimum description length. It works uh, like a charm. So uh, we use this um, this method that we have generalized with Martin Rosewell some years ago. And what we found was a very beautiful, uh, beautiful results. Uh, first, it's a cohesive groups of diseases uh, that share high um, intragroup similarity uh, in terms of both molecular and uh, um, clinical, uh, and say the phenotypic uh, uh, the phenotypic level. But the other thing that was interesting was this uh, connection between uh, Mendelian disorders and complex disorders. So essentially there is this paper from 2013 uh, assessing that uh, some Mendel com simple diseases, let me say Mendelian disorder, can increase the risk for some complex diseases. Actually, we find groups that match this hypothesis and we find several groups like this. Okay, again, no time for the details, but there is the paper and uh, I can answer more questions uh, later. And uh, we have also discovered new disease-disease disease interactions that were not uh, easy to find from standard approaches, like uh, integrating molecular information, et cetera, et cetera, but that were reported in the literature. So we're finding their coexistence, uh, their co-presence uh, in, uh, in some publications. So this is very interesting. It's showing the power of, uh, of, this, of this framework. And then as the other uh, application, it's a work done with Vera Pancaldi's lab, uh, the Ocopol uh, in, 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 in Toulouse, and the group of Giuseppe Jurman at, FB, at FBK in, in Trento. It was uh, our attempt to understand at the very beginning the potential impact of an infection of SARS-CoV-2, so the, the virus of, of COVID. Again, here, a lot of work to build uh, the data set. In a, in a nutshell, uh, we use uh, data from BioGrid and String. Uh, we link them together in such a way to have uh, a, a meaningful uh, representation of the human interactome. Then we have enriched this interactome with uh, a lot of information. Uh, so from the gene ontology, disease, gene disease interactions, so symptoms interaction, and also drug target interactions. Why? Because we wanted to build, uh, uh, well, we wanted to build uh, some, uh, so, uh, uh, some representation of information relating uh, the um, the viruses and the target of these viruses in terms of the human uh, human proteins and how these human proteins were related to everything else biological processes uh, symptoms other diseases etc. So to do this we needed the, the set of uh, target proteins at that time it was the very early time uh, it appeared in, in April 2020 if I remember correctly this uh, this paper from uh, Gordon and, and others with the first uh, nearly 300 uh, proteins uh, targeted by the SARS-CoV-2. And then there were some other papers uh, showing uh, interactions, relationships with uh, a few more proteins. So we have used all of this uh, information uh, to build. Uh, so this is the, the general the general idea. Here you have the SARS-CoV-2 attacking your uh, uh, so the human proteins, and the human proteins are related to a lot of other a lot of other things. So what did we? Uh, this is the real data. Okay. So this is the the representation, so the theory and the practice. Uh, why? This is very complicated to analyze, I mean, because also you want to extract information, it's just not a matter, again, to apply algorithms. And uh, what we tried was a very simple approach, that's why I, I like to, to discuss about, about this, uh, this paper. Essentially, our approach was, okay, what if we cut the existing connection between the virus and the interactome, and then we rewire them in such a way that we just, our null model is what happens 
to the network that I have shown before, if instead of targeting the specific uh, human targets uh, the, from the SARS-CoV-2, I target uh, the same number of proteins, but chosen randomly, totally randomly, so very simple. Then we have chosen some uh, measure like, related to the, the, to the degree, and then just by doing this operation several times to build your null models, you compare what you get from the data with what you get from the null models. And uh, you calculate a z-score as simple as, uh, as that. Well, taking into account the fact that uh, sometimes uh, this uh, does not uh, distribute in a normal way. So you cannot just uh, transform your z-score using the standard error of functions. So you have to make, uh, to be careful with the statistics. So we use the Chebyshev statistics as well. So again, without going into much detail, but uh, at the end of the day, you can associate a z-score to, for instance, uh, the biological processes involved in your network. Here you have the, the gene ontology, some terms from the gene ontology, and you see that most of them are related to viral processes, uh, DNA, uh, DNA replication, RNA binding, all the things that are related to the attack of one virus to the human interactor. So it makes sense. This is nice. It was a way to, to even to, to validate uh, uh, the, 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 the procedure. But then we, we studied the, the diseases that are, were related to, uh, to the infection, uh, well, the, the, let's say the phenotype in general, uh, to the attack of uh, the SARS-CoV-2. And uh, we were uh, literally puzzling about the results because as you see here, you, you see impact on uh, uh, several systems uh, from the liver to the, uh, the lungs, uh, the brain. So our first uh, reaction seeing this result was uh, we have a bug in the code. Uh, I remember, so it was April, uh, May, 2020. We, didn't, we knew nothing about the virus. Then we asked the Vera to do the same with another pipeline and uh, they found exactly the same results. So actually there was no bug in the results. The point is that uh, we discovered that SARS-CoV-2 was a systemic disease. And uh, this was the right interpretation of this uh, of these uh, of these results. So if I have two minutes, so maybe it's a, it's a it's a wait. Okay, uh, I will just uh, mention what uh, uh, we are doing now. We are trying to do there in Padua. Also, what is uh, my my own vision about the development of this uh, of this field? So first of all, the thing that I would like you to remind is that uh, reductionist approaches are good when you are studying the right thing. Okay, if you are studying complex diseases, you cannot. Uh, uh, employ this way, this mindset, uh, because uh, these methods cannot be enough. And uh, now we are moving towards, uh, 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 at least from the physics uh, perspective, uh, to, uh, to see the disease as a change in the state of uh, a healthy organism. Okay, so you can uh, you you have to imagine this in terms of internal perturbation that you can do to a system and external perturbation that you can do to the same system. The system here is an organism. And uh, if you have these perturbations, uh, they will change the state of your system. What does it mean? It means that essentially uh, things that, so that if the concentration of metabolites in your metabolic uh, uh, pathways, okay, uh, they can change. And these changes uh, can be understood as uh, the, um, the onset of, of, of a disease. So this is reiterated the, the change of a state of your, of your uh, organism. And once you accept uh, this way of thinking, okay, it's just a matter of interpretation, then you can enter into this world uh, that is uh, the world of complexity science where you can study systems with very powerful tools, okay, well, well beyond algorithms. Uh, you can really learn and gain uh, new insights about uh, uh, about the development uh, of uh, of a system. So now this is what I'm pushing uh, for uh, in my lab, uh, and also I'm trying to do this uh, with uh, with the network uh, uh, medicine center. And then of course there is this idea of digital twins that is gaining a lot of momentum right now because it's very promising. I mean the idea is that you can use a huge data set, massive data set, and when computing to stratify in some complex uh, way, your, uh, your, your patients, okay, the, the, the population. And then uh, once you have uh, this stratification, uh, you can uh, try your uh, uh, interventions on the digital twin and then get the, the one, so to avoid arming the individuals, and then you pick the best one according to some, uh, to some quality, quality function. Well, this is a great idea, I think, 
but uh, this implementation it's uh, it's quite complicated it uh, it requires uh, a lot of steps it requires a lot of information first of all and it requires uh, the right mindset because uh, all of these things uh, so building the digital twin of a human body or even of something <laughs> easier like uh, the c elegance okay this is a very small uh, nematode so it's very complicated because you have multiple systems across the scales and they interact with each other as i was showing before so it's uh, it's not uh, simple to make a claim that uh, we are in the era of digital twins or they are going to appear very soon because I don't think this is the case. And uh, uh, once uh, you define what uh, uh, operationally what a digital twin is, uh, you need models again. So you don't need only data. That's the point. At least this is my uh, my my viewpoint. And these models uh, have to rely multi-layer approaches because uh, they naturally encode the multi-level description so across the scales and the existence of multiple contexts at the same scale okay so it's not just a matter of structure it's also a matter of uh, having time varying structures because uh, they can change in time you are not always the same uh, during the world duration of your life you change over time so also our model should change our time and uh, we are adaptive you are not the same uh, now, and if uh, in one week from now there will be 50 degrees uh, out here, so your state, uh, state of your system will change accordingly. So because you are in a adapt complex adaptive system, okay? And uh, any digital twin should account for the context, for the environment, for all these interactions. I'm not saying that we have to build a model at the macroscopic level of everything, but we have to account for the right things intervening at the right moment. So, the, uh, now you can imagine what is the answer. If the data are, are enough, well, I think that they are not uh, enough. They have to be complemented by biological understanding, by modeling. And uh, with this, I thank a lot of collaborators. So I discuss about many uh, works even very quickly, but uh, a lot of people involved, uh, involved here and also the people recently joining my lab with whom we are pushing forward all of this stuff. So thank you for the attention. Thank you, Mario. This is uh, all fascinating and, and really like, you know, in line with, uh, with all the things that we do, as you mentioned as well, like there are a lot of, uh, you know, like of connections. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, time for a couple of questions, maybe like uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, at the start of the presentation, you were speaking about the two types of businesses of topological features and functional features and how they add up to obtain the distance between them and how it could be useful that you were going to further explain it. Could you put it down? So the, the difference between the topological and the functional or some more details about how to do that in practice? Yes, and, and how the how the two features add up to a new feature? I didn't know, I don't remember which name you... Well, well uh, let me go, but this is very small. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know why, but we can go there. already the multi-layer yeah we are here yeah okay so you want to know more about uh, this step yes okay yeah okay so essentially that step that can, can be performed in the way that you that you like once you have uh, a clear measure of distance between nodes okay so we don't uh, at least personally, I, I don't have to suggest a specific approach here to pass uh, from a distance matrix uh, to the manifold. You can use whatever whatever you like because there are a lot of methods. Okay, this is this is beyond network science. I mean, it, it enters into the field of, uh, uh, of of machine learning, and uh, where I am not an expert, uh, we used uh, in the past uh, multidimensional scaling. We use a UMAP. Uh, you, you are free to use literally what you want, provided that you uh, control perfectly the, the 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 thing that you are doing what is interesting for me as a network scientist uh, is the the way you build the distance matrix okay because uh, 
uh, well, uh, in, in machine learning in general, you have vectors of features so for your nodes, then you build some kind of measure like uh, the cosine distance or, or all of these things uh, can be more or less sophisticated. Uh, and then you start from that distance to do whatever you like. Here instead, uh, what, uh, what, what, what we do is to account, is to go beyond that pure node in node level information. Here you account for the structure of the network. For instance, uh, there are methods that have been uh, developed here in Barcelona, actually, the people in the University of Barcelona, Marianne Boguia and Mariangela Serrano, they are very famous for these models, uh, the hyperbolic uh, geometric model of networks, where they extract, uh, they build a latent, a latent manifold starting from the structure, and uh, they um, uh, where they define uh, the distance in such a way that they, um, it accounts for the existence of the links. Okay, uh, I, I, and they know, I, I am friend with them, uh, but they know that I prefer the other approach because it's more complete where we have the, 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 the dynamics. In that case, I can give you a simple example uh, in the case of diffusion. Okay, here, in, this is the probability that within a given time tau, you, uh, <clears throat> you find your random workers in some part of the network, assuming the condition to the hypothesis that they start in not i at time zero. Okay, I don't know, I can make maybe, if you, if you got it, it's okay. So you have your network, you put uh, an ensemble of random workers in node i at time zero, you allow them to go through the network. You do the same in node j, uh, you, do, you allow them to go through the network. And then you ask, uh, within a, a time steps uh, tau, wherever they meet each other uh, around the network, okay? you count, literally, because this is a way for uh, mapping signaling, uh, moving randomly through the network. Then you can build uh, this uh, uh, idea of the, uh, the, the this measure of distance, and this is nothing different than uh, the diffusion eigenmaps that you find uh, in, in machine learning. But it's applied to the case of networks. And uh, from this distance, uh, we I, I remember if I remember I used the multidimensional scaling here to do all of my calculations. So nothing nothing fancy. So I don't know if I answered the, the question, but the step related to machine learning uh, way to use the distances, uh, I am less expert on that. So I I use what, what, what the machine learning community offers. And there are a lot of methods. I like a lot of UMAP, but I mean, it's, uh, it's me. Yeah. So I, I had a question about this, um, this question about correlation and network that we need zero consensus of data. So you mentioned like you would do a correlation and then pressure it. But I know in Bayesian Maps there's a method that is widely used that is called WGCMA. I don't know if you know about this method, but basically it's taking the correlation matrix and then taking some power of everything. And then it's trying to find um, a parameter so the off-chain network would look like a scale-free network. So I don't know if you know about this method. It's widely used because then it's it's a bit of trick to make a correlation network look like a what case. look like what you want. Look like what you want. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is the, this is the big deal. Have your, your on that? Uh, I have a strong opinion. I am recorded, so I cannot answer this question. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. No, what what I mean, you if you your target uh, is uh, to claim that the bi biological network that you are studying, it's a scale free, then you are literally manipulating your method to achieve a scale free. And then you study it as a scale free. But this is uh, not what I call uh, science, because I don't know in advance if your biological network is a scale free. This is a strong hypothesis. I mean, you are literally imposing the result. Mm, I, 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 I don't know. No, you, you are doing this until you reach a scale free structure. Then yeah, you are literally the power of the yeah, but the, the power of the power of the agency matrix is encoding uh, the walks that you do from one node that connects to two nodes. Okay, for instance, along the diagonal of a power matrix of the power of the agency matrix, you have the number of closed walks of a given length. So the power k is the number of uh, K loops that start uh, that are originated and finish in the same node. If you do this with other, you, you can calculate uh, the walks of length K between any pair of nodes. This is for the agency matrix. If you apply this on uh, a correlation matrix where your numbers are non-integers and where the entries are correlations, I am not able to understand what is the meaning of getting the power. 
So, uh, no, I, 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 have, I, I have a strong opinion about understanding uh, the things that we do once we apply whatever. We can apply whatever mathematical operation. It's plenty of mathematical operation. We can invent a lot of mathematical operation just by reassembling uh, existing things. You can get uh, the exponential of a matrix. Uh, you will still get something that is interesting. This has been done. It's the definition of the communicability matrix. It's literally the exponential of the agency matrix. Uh, you you can introduce, uh, I think, an, an infinite number of uh, definitions, but the, the other point is to understand what those definitions uh, are encoding uh, from a, a physical perspective, or most of the time, or at least biologically. In the example that I was bringing, once you work with correlation networks, uh, it's uh, you, you, you need a lot, a lot of care uh, to, to, to work with correlation networks because uh, the link is not there. At best, you have the probability that the link is there, at best. And this is not even the case because it's a functional thing. So imagine that you have a structure where you have uh, one node here and two nodes that are connected to this node, uh, forming an open triangle. Then you calculate your correlation measures between the nodes that are not connected with each other, but they will still show correlations because they are driven by the same driver. And so once you put this thing, you start to make powers and thresholding, all of these things, you, you lose control of what's going on. And then, of course, results will, will appear. I agree. But I don't know if you are able to understand the meaning of, of the results. So do, 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 do you agree? Yeah, it sounds reasonable, but then I would like you to... But you have to do something. You know, I, I agree also with that. that there must be a trade-off between the understanding and uh, the proliferation of, of methods, because otherwise uh, we'll really, really lose control. So, thanks for, for, for many, many interesting things, and I'm, I'm sure I don't understand all of them. So for the correlations, obviously, the matrix of correlations is entangled. So there are implicit entangled indirect correlations, let's just say. But there are at the same time, there are a number of methods to get rid of the indirect correlations. Within a given confidence level. With a given confidence. I agree, fully agree. Then you can apply those methods to clear, you know, I'm not saying that it's yeah, wrong. I mean, I say you, you... it's an object. You argue about the, that this, all these nodes will be distinguished, but it's fine. But at the end, the solutions are very difficult to use. So you end up going for a practical solution that is the average. So the distribution that is the solution, the practical solution that we are using. Um, with with networks. No, 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 with networks, uh, this, uh, this, this can uh, happen when you work with homogeneous networks. So if the underlying structure that you don't observe is homogeneous, what you are saying, so that you are uh, with these methods, you are recognizing the average or the expected value of the, it, it, it's correct, okay? Uh, because uh, the homogeneity of the network makes things working pretty well. And then I, I fully agree that using your methods for cleaning, for manipulating uh, in the right way where you have control is perfect. For heterogeneous network, this is no more the case. And this is no more the case also when you have a strong topological correlations between uh, between the nodes. So if you have a strongly disassortative or assortative network, so structures where you have hubs connected to a lot of leaves or hubs strongly connected to other hubs. So that thing that the average will be just representative, it's, it's a bit more tricky. And I will not... Uh, be completely sure that is uh, that you can get just uh, the average value. Probably you will need uh, uh, at least more uh, more moments of the distribution to be representative. I would say at least uh, the, the second. Is there a way to quantify the structure of the network to tell you how far it is from this assumption of using the average? This is this is a very good question, but actually this uh, this part of the field is not really well uh, developed. So this would be something that would be nice to, to do. There is no way, to the best of my knowledge, uh, to, to, ex to understand the amount of heterogeneity that you have uh, in, in the network that you are not observing just from the analysis of time series or from vector uh, uh, data that you have about, uh, about the nodes. It would be interesting to devise some grounded model for... Uh, for, for... Central question in talking about some protein families are very homogeneous. Some protein families are very heterogeneous. 
some of the history the, the philosophy of space and the technology. And we have a way of comparing that comparing them in the quantity. Yeah. I think we have an example of this. We may be quantified to the range of energy of thousand different variations of our particular energy. In principle, yes, I will start always from synthetic data. Uh, so I will generate uh, the closest thing uh, to what you're mentioning right now. And then uh, I will uh, devise a method uh, for uh, that works well under some uh, reasonable uh, conditions uh, for the synthetic data. And then uh, maybe uh, it will, yeah. The other, I mean, but the other thing that uh, maybe we can find in the The other thing that Pascal asked very much is this, uh, the clustering on the synthetic on the standard networks. Uh, because it's all what we use. All the, all the biological applications are based on clustering. I know. Finding the clustering in the right networks. It's a visual data. I don't think I, I fully understand the, the argument. So you, you were mentioning the paper in 2022. Uh, it, there, there is a lot behind. Uh, actually, I uh the the the, the guy uh, i would say the reference person for uh, all of these things that is uh, the development of the greek or stochastic blob modeling uh, uh accounting for uh, hypothesis nested uh, hypothesis etc uh is tiago pesciotto uh in uh, in is um, uh, now uh, associate professor in vienna but i have to say that you have also another grid bayesian uh, network scientist with uh, roger guimera in, uh, in tarragona uh, he, he works a lot with, uh, or used to work a lot with biological networks. I cite also one of his papers, it's a nature paper with uh, Luisa Maral about the cartography of a metabolic uh, metabolic network. And uh, they, I know that uh, the CIS lab with Marta Sales uh, uh, Pardo, they are developing a lot of methods using this, uh, at least the mindset. Then uh, the most uh, theoretical part, so to understand uh, the ensemble method and so on, uh, probably I would ask uh, Iago, uh, Peixoto, if you want more details about what is behind the, the generative models. Uh, what I what I, I do here is to use the, those methods uh, and also I I attack more, I am more applied in these sciences than, than, than theoretical, and uh, I attack uh, uh, real data. So I try to devise methods that allow me to answer specific questions about the data that I have. And this of the inverse method that is uh, Start information from from things from the effects, not from the causes, is uh, something that I am working uh, uh, on. But it's not it's uh, not easy. It's very complicated to to do that reconstruction that I was uh, well that I was showing uh, before. Because uh, not only because of the confounders, so there are literally theorems that say no free lunch. Uh, you 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 cannot do things uh, or you cannot uh, push your methods beyond specific limits. Uh, by mathematical uh, uh, proof. So, uh, thank you, Madhu, for a super interesting talk. Uh, so, my question is more on uh, trying to keep up with your opinion in this case, okay? Uh, because um, when I see multi layer models applied in biology, and particularly in biology, one thing I missed, and that's something I like from your, your presentation, that somehow we're inferring the importance of how you build your multi-layer network, why you build it the way you do, right? Uh, it's about evaluation of the contribution of the layers, uh, contribution of each one of the different networks that are being in the model. This is something that sometimes I, or sometimes, many times in, in applications to biology, I see this. So uh, I, I wanted to ask you about your opinion on how you see this in the near future to be approached. <laughs> and... Actually, this depends uh, on, uh, on on how many times uh, we go to speak about these things in other institutions and in conferences uh, that are mostly done by biologists, I think. Because uh, I was um, I was invited into an EMBO meeting, a workshop uh, some years ago. I have discussed about this, and uh, I have uh, discussed with the audience that were only biologists uh, about a very simple application that I can tell you. Imagine that you have uh, n nodes, n can be ten nodes, one hundred nodes, whatever you like, 
And on each node, you generate uh, white noise. And that white noise is a time series that you, you assume is data. Then you apply whatever pipeline that you have uh, now in computational biology for the analysis of this data. And then you will build the networks out of this. I invite you to do this with any method that you like. Okay, you will find networks and there are no networks because it's white noise and nodes are disconnected. I'm, I'm not telling nothing about it. And you will find a lot of networks. You can analyze those networks. You can analyze the modularity of those networks. You will find modules. Tell me how it's possible that you can apply all of these things blindly to data. For me, it's impossible. So the only thing that you can do now is to attack problems with the generative models or to at least ask the right question. It is, okay, I'm doing this, I have, I have the data, but what happens if I randomize? What happens if I cut the links? What we did, for example, for the SARS-CoV-2. What happens if uh, I reapply the full pi complicated and sophisticated pipeline of my analysis uh, to a randomized version of my network? And at least you, you, you build distributions uh, and you compare those distributions with the value that you get from the data. It's something. It's still not the best thing that you can do, but it's uh, much better than uh, going uh, blindly on, uh, on the data. And their reaction was, uh, well, and so what? Literally, yeah, it yeah. was uh, some years ago now. I, I wanted to ask you about this because it's, uh, it was also my experience, right? Uh, in the end, you go to any bio biology focus in conference to talk about this, and always the question is the same: is why these layers? Why not others? What are they giving? What are they not giving? And, and they, they doesn't. Sometimes I miss this this logic. Um, so that's why I want to ask you. It takes time. And whenever you will give your talks, uh, you will stress these points. And, you know, it's a behavioral spreading. People uh, will get infected by your way of attacking problems. Uh, and at some point, it, it, if it's correct, uh, it will become a standard. But it takes time. Okay, I think that for the sake of the interest of time, uh, we stop here. I have a lot of questions, but we can put uh, over the lunch. Uh, thank you so much, Mario, again. Thank, thank you for the invitation. Time.